from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and this is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. It's the Europe event, which of course this year has gone virtual. Really lets us uh, be able to talk to those guests where they are around the globe. Really happy to welcome back to the program, Liz Rice. Uh, first of all, she is the Vice President of Open Source Engineering at Aqua Security. She is also the Chair of the Technical Oversight uh, Committee as, as part of uh, CNCF. Uh, Liz, uh, it, it is great to see you. Uh, unfortunately, it's remote, but uh, great to catch up with you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice to see you, if, you know, across the ocean. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big things, of course, for the, the KubeCon show, it's the rallying point for the, for the uh, community. Uh, there are so many people participating. One of the things we always love to highlight, it, it's not only the, uh, the, the vendor ecosystem, but there is a very robust, engaged, uh, community of end users that participate in it. Uh, and as I mentioned, you're the chair of the, the uh, technology oversight uh, committee. So maybe just you know, give our audience a little bit of, you know, in case they're not familiar, what the TOC does and you know, let, let's talk about the latest uh, pieces there. Yeah, so the TOC is really here to kind of qualify the different projects that want to join the CNCF. So we're assessing whether or not they're cloud native. We're assessing uh, whether they could join at uh, sandbox or incubation or graduation levels, which are the different maturity levels that we have for, for projects within the CNCF. And yeah, we're really there to um, also provide a kind of steering around the, uh, what does cloud native mean? And what does it mean to be a project inside the CNCF community? We're also a voice for the projects, not the only voice, but you know, part of our role really is to make sure the projects are getting what they need in order to be successful. So it's it's really around the technology and the projects that we call cloud native. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you said cloud native because when people first heard of the show, of course, Kubernetes and KubeCon uh, was the big discussion point, but as you said, cloud native, there's a lot of projects there. I, I, I just you know, glanced at the Sandbox page and I think there's over 30 uh, in the Sandbox category uh, and you know, they move along their process until they're you know, fully mature uh, and reach that you know, 1.0 state, which is the, the stamp of approval that you know, this can be used in production. Uh, I understand there's been some updates uh, for, for the Sandbox process, so uh, help us understand you know, where that is and what, what's the new piece of that. Yeah, so it's really been because of the growth of cloud native in general, the popularity of the CNCF and so much innovation happening in our space. So there've been so many projects who want to become part of the CNCF family. And uh, we used to have a sponsorship model where members of the TOC would uh, essentially back projects that they wanted to see joining at the sandbox level. But we ran into a number of issues with that process and uh, also dealing with the scale, the number of applications that have come in. So we've revamped the process, we've made it much easier for projects to apply, it's a much simpler form. We're really not making so much judgment. We're, we're really saying, is it a cloud native project? And we have some requirements in terms of um, some governance features that we need from a project. And it's worth mentioning that when a project joins the CNCF, they are donating the intellectual property and the trademark of that project into the foundation. So it's not something that people should take lightly, but we have tried to make it easier and therefore much smoother. We're able to um, you know, assess the applications much more quickly, which I think everyone, the community, the projects, those of us on the TOC, we're all pretty happy that we can make that a much faster process. Yeah, uh, I, I actually, it brings up a, an interesting point, Liz. So, you know, I've got a little bit of background uh, in standards uh, committees, uh, as well as, you know, you know, I've been involved in open source for, for a couple of decades now. Some people don't understand, you know, when you talk about bringing a project under a foundation, you talked about things like trademarks and the like, there are more than one foundation out there. Of course, CNCF uh, falls under the Linux Foundation. Uh, 
Google, of course, brought Kubernetes in fully uh, to be supported. Uh, there's been some rumblings I've heard for the last couple of years about Istio and Knative. And I know uh, about a month before the show, uh, there was uh, some changes along Istio and what Google was doing there. Maybe, maybe, you know, without trying to pass too many judgments and getting into some of the political arguments, help us understand, you know, what Google did and, uh, you know, wh where that uh, kind of compares to the projects that sit in the CNCF themselves. Yeah, so I guess two years ago, around two years ago, Istio was very much the new kid in the cloud native block. Um, so much excitement about the project and it was actually when i was a uh, program co-chair that we had a lot of talks about istio at kubecon cloud native con um, particularly in copenhagen I'm, I'm recalling and uh i think everyone just saw a natural fit between that project and the cncf and there was an assumption from a lot of people across the community that it would eventually become part of the, the CNCF, that was its natural home. And one of the things that we saw in recent weeks was a very clear statement from IBM, who were one of the uh, sort of big contributing companies towards that project, that that was also their expectation. They were very much under the impression that Istio would be donated to the CNCF at an appropriate point of maturity. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, from my point of view, I, I think that has sown a, a lot of confusion amongst the community because we've seen so much. It, it, you know, it's very much a project that fits a service mesh designed to work with Kubernetes. It's, it really does uh, you know, fit naturally in with the other CNCF projects. So it's created confusion for end users, who many of whom assume that it was part of the CNCF and that it has the neutral governance that the other projects, you know, it's, it's part of the, the, the requirements that we have on those projects. They have to have an open governance that they're um, not controlled by a single vendor. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, that confusion and, and frustration around that confusion being expressed by more and more end users as well as other people across the community. Um, yeah, the the door is still open. You know, we we would still love to see Istio join the community. Uh, clearly, there are different opinions within the the Istio maintainers. Um, I we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, and no, Liz, you bring up some really good points. You know, absolutely, some some of that confusion out there. Absolutely, I've heard from customers that if they're making a decision point, they might say, "Hey, maybe I'm not going to go down that Istio path. Maybe I'll." choose something else because uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, you know, Istio front and center, Knative, another project uh, currently under Google uh, that has, you know, a number of, of, of other, you know, big vendors in the community that are participating in that. So hopefully mm -hmm. we will see some progress on that, uh, you know, going forward. But, uh, you know, back to you talked about, uh, you know, the TOC doesn't make judgments as to, you know, which project and how they are. You know, one of the really nice things out there in the CNCF is like the landscape just for you to help understand, okay, here's all of these projects, here's the different categories they fit in, here's where they are along their maturity. Uh, there's another tool uh, that I read Cheryl Hung's blog about, uh, the, the technology radar, I believe it's for continuous uh, delivery is, is, is the first technology radar. Help us understand how that is, you know, not telling customers what to do, but giving them a little guidance as to, you know, where some of these project, projects fit in a certain segment. Yeah, the technology radar is a really great uh, initiative. I'm, I'm really excited about it because we have increasing numbers of end users who are using these different projects, it, it, both inside the CNCF and projects that are outside of the, the CNCF family. Um, you know, end users are building stacks, they're solving real problems in the real world. And with the technology radar, what uh, Cheryl's been able to facilitate is having the end user, end user community share with us what tools they're actually using, what do they actually believe are the right hammers for specific nails. And, you know, it's, it's one thing for us as, um, you know, as more on the developer or vendor side to look at different projects and say what we think are the, the better solutions for solving different problems. 
actually hearing from the horse's mouth, from the end users who are doing it in the real world is super valuable. And I think that is a really useful input to help us understand what are the problems that the end users still are challenged by? What are the, the gaps that we still need to fill? Um, you know, the more input we can get from the end user community, the more we'll be solving real problems and not necessarily academic problems that we haven't necessarily you know, discovered in the real world. All right, well, Liz, you know, teeing up a discussion about challenges that users still have in the real world, um, if we go to your uh, you know, primary jobs, main hat is you live in the security world. And we you know, we know uh, security is still something you know, front and center. It is something that is never done. Uh, lots of discussion about the shared responsibility model and how cloud native and security fit together and all that. So maybe yeah, I, I, I know there's some new projects there, but love to just you know, give me a snapshot as to where we are in the security space. Uh, as I said, overall, it's been, you know, super important topic for years. Uh, so this year with the global pandemic going on, security seems to be raised even more. We've seen a couple of acquisitions in the space. Uh, of course, Aqua Security, uh, helping customers along uh, their security journey. Uh, so you know, what, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace today and hearing hear from your customers? Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure every business this year has, has you know, looked at what's going on and uh, you know, it, it's been crazy time for everyone. But we've been pleasantly surprised at um, you know, how, you know, in relative terms, our, our business has been you know, able to, it, it's been strong, you know, and I think, you know, what you're touching on the fact that people are working remotely, people are doing so many things online, security is ever more, um, you know, online cloud security is ever more part of what people need to pay attention to. We're doing more and more business online. So actually, for those of us in the security business, it has been, you know, there, there have been some silver linings to this, uh, this pandemic cloud. Um, yeah, so, and in terms of technology, the open source projects and, and in particularly defaults in Kubernetes, things are improving. It's long been a thing that I've, um, you know, wished for and talked about that, you know, some of the, the default settings have not always been um, the most secure they could be. We've seen a lot of improvements over the last two or three years. We're seeing, continuing to see innovation in the open source world. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, on the commercial side and, and products that vendors like Aqua, um, you know, we're continuing to innovate. We're continuing to provide new ways for customers to validate that the application workloads that they're going to run are going to run securely in the cloud. All right. And, and Liz, uh, there, there's a new project that I know, uh, you know, you and Aqua are participating in. Uh, tell us a little bit about Starbird, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the problem it's helping to solve and, uh, you know, where, where, where that project's at today. Yeah, so Starboard is uh, one of our open source initiatives coming out of my team at Aqua. And um, the idea is to take security reporting information and turn it into Kubernetes native uh, resources custom resources and then that means the security information your current security status can be queried over the kubernetes api so as you're querying the status of a deployment say you can also be querying to see whether it's passing configuration audits or it's passing vulnerability scans for the, the application containers inside that deployment so the information is available through the same uh, APIs, through the Kube control interface, through dashboards like uh, Octon, which is uh, a nice uh, sort of dashboard viewer for, for Kubernetes. Um, Starboard brings security information, not just from Aqua tools, but from uh, other vendor tools as well, front and center into that Kubernetes experience. So I'm really excited about Starboard. I think it's uh, you know going to be a great way of getting security visibility uh, to more Kubernetes users. All right, and Liz, we, we were talking earlier about just the, the, the maturity of projects and how they get into the sandbox. Is, is this still pre-sandbox uh, uh, for this project? Oh yeah, it, we're still very much in the early phases. And uh, you know, it, I think in the open source world, we have the um, ability to share what we're doing quite early so that we can get feedback, we can see 
how it resonates with with real users. We've had some great feedback from uh, from uh, partners that we've we've worked with and um, from some Aqua customers who who we actually collaborated with when we were sort of going through the initial design. Some great feedback. There's still lots of work to do, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the initial feedback has been really positive. Yeah, is, is usually uh, the event is one of those places where you can help try to recruit some other people that might have tools as well as uh, you know educate customers about what's going on. So is that that part of the call to action on this? Is to you know what are you looking for uh, you know for, for kind of the rest of 2020 when it when it comes to this project? Yeah, absolutely. So internally, we're working on uh, an operator which will automate uh, some of the the, the sort of work that Starboard does in the background. But in terms of uh, getting more collaboration, we would love to see um, integrations for more security tooling. Um, the, the, we're talking with some people across the community about the resource definitions. So we've come up with uh, some custom resource definitions, but we'd love them to be applicable to, to a variety of different tools. So, so we want to get feedback on, on those definitions. So if people are interested in collaborating on that, Absolutely, do come and talk to me and my team at Aqua. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Great, Liz, and, and I'll give you the final word. Uh, obviously, we're we're getting the community together uh, while we're apart. So, uh, you know, any other you know engagement opportunities, uh, you know, get-togethers, things that you want people to know uh, about the European show this year. Well, it's going to be really, you know, it, it, I'm on tenter hooks to see whether or not we can recreate the same atmosphere as we would have in KubeCon. I mean, it clearly won't be exactly the same, but uh, I really hope that, you know, people will engage online, do come and, and, you know, ask questions of the speakers, come and talk to the vendors, get into Slack channels with the community. You know, this is an opportunity to, you know, pretend we're in the same room. Let's, let's, let's do what we can to, to, uh, to recreate as close as we can that community experience that you know, is famous for. Yeah, ab absolutely. That hallway track is something that is super challenging to recreate. Um, and there's no way that I am getting the Indonesian food that I was so looking forward to in Amsterdam, uh, just such a great culinary and cultural city. Uh, so hopefully sometime in the future, we'll be able to be back there. Liz Rice, always a pleasure catching up with you. Uh, thanks so much for all the work you're doing on the TOC and always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me. All right, lots more coverage from KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, the European 2020 show, of course, virtual. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching The Cube.